I'm live. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. So everyone should be in. Um, so let me just do some introductions. I'm Lisa Chow. I'm a strategist for HCM. And while I cover some of these configurable frameworks, my primary modules are absence, time, and labor, uh, compensation. I do cover HCM architecture and some of the um, enterprise component uh, frameworks. So, and then along with me, I have Jeremy Pelly helping me moderate today. So if you see him, it's, that's why. And if you want to ask him any oddball questions, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, so let's get started because we have a lot to get through today. I have mm, 120 slides, so. Okay, we have the safe harbor because um, actually I'm not sure we're going to need this. Well, I do talk a little bit about what's coming in the future, so um, you'll you'll you'd have seen that. So we saw the introduction. Um, oh wait, let me do this one thing. I do have a couple of polls. I'm going just about to launch them. If you would mind going out and um, filling those in, that would be great. And so I can get that at the end. Okay. So the configurable frameworks, this session today, there are four basic questions that I want to answer with this presentation. Oops, sorry. Press the wrong button. First of all, what does the framework do? So give you a high level of what it does, give you examples of where it is used, um, give you some high level on the configuration. I will give you navigation to how to get to configuration um, because these frameworks go between some being partly in tools, some being partly in HCM architecture, and some being in enterprise components. So it's not always the easiest thing to find them. So um, I, I figured the uh, navigation would be good. And what else should you know about it? So these are going to be things like, what is the tools release um, you need to be on, as well as links to resources. So the first one let's look at is the Activity Guide Composer. So as you may know, there is an Activity Guide in PeopleTools, which the Activity Guide Composer is actually built on. But what the Activity Guide Composer gives you is a simpler way of um, building Activity Guide templates by splitting up the technical and functional tasks. So we'll look at, you know, the configuration that a technical person would do versus the configuration a functional person would do. Um, and I am reading notes. I'm not, it's not that I don't know this. I just, there's so much uh, information in this presentation that I just don't want to forget to give you things. So, um, so it improves the deployment of the activity guides because it you know, frees up your technical resources. Once they do the basic configuration of the category, then your functional people can go in and create templates. And I'll show you what that means. Okay. So some examples of where it's used, um, onboarding and offboarding, uh, when we re-delivered life events, the managed position, the new fluid managed position, open enrollment, in, and then in the fluid extended absence. Okay. So this is a screenshot of what it looks like in the onboarding. Um, so you can see down the left-hand side, there's the various steps. Um, and that is configurable. So you can configure it to go down the left, across the top. Um, so there's, there's options that your functional users actually can can um, select. Here it's the benefits open enrollment, also a vertical um, step type of a, um, a activity guide. And this is the extended absence request. So this is uh, 
this was delivered. Some of these are delivered as system data, which means that you can't actually change the templates that we deliver. In the configuration, I'll show you how to work with system delivered templates. So, so for instance, you know, um, in the onboarding, we deliver a template to give you the basic steps that could be included. Now you can go ahead and modify that without being it being a customization. And I'll show you how to do that. Okay. So as far as configuration, so this is a piece that your technical person would go in and do, and this is setting up categories in the Activity Guide Composer. So this first page is more, you know, general information about, you know, what this category is about. And then the important part for them, you know, obviously they'll go through security and and the um, context and some actions images but the real important part that that really makes the difference is in the steps so they will add what i consider to be like a superset of steps so for onboarding every possible step that you could conceivably conceivably put in a template so for instance if you have a you want to make one template for USA people, and then you want another one for Canadian hires, and maybe a third template for executives. So all the steps you would need for all three of those are put into the category. And then when the functional person goes to create the templates, the, the three individual templates, it's just like shopping on Amazon and you pick this step, you pick this step, but pick that step kind of a thing. So here, you see that there is actually 36 steps, but you may only use, say, 12 in a normal template. Okay. And this is where they do have to do things like, you know, have a service type and, and do all their techie stuff. Obviously, I'm not technical. That's why I call it such technical names. Um, and then once they're done with that, then as a functional person, you can go in and do your piece. So notifications is a recent uh, enhancement, and this is where it allows you to send out um, notifications. So for instance, if you have a multi-person activity guide, so we have single users, so an onboarding is normally, say, a single user. But offboarding, you may have the, the person who's leaving participate in that activity guide. You may have their manager sign them off and collect their badge. And you may have someone else collecting company property. So they have to fill out different pages that are all part of this offboarding activity guide. So as their steps become open and they have to perform that step, you might want to send out an initial notification. And so this is says, hey, your step is open, go ahead and perform what you have to you know, do for this. There's also an overdue. So if something like an I-9 has a definite due date, and if they're overdue, it will send a reminder notification, uh, a, a notification, and then it, you can also send reminders. So even if they don't have due dates, you can say, well, it's been open for this long. Hey, you might want to go in and look at this kind of a thing. So you set it up on the category, and then even on the template, um, you can decide whether you're going to implement any of those notifications. So this is the activity guide templates. And here, this, this is a list of all of the templates. Most of these are ones, or a lot of these are ones that we actually deliver. So if you see one with a 1-1-1900 date, uh, you'll know it's one that we delivered. So here you can update the template. You can clone the template. So if you want to use ours as a basis, but say you just want to do a whole different one, you can go ahead and clone it. And you can delete it. You can only delete it if it's not one that we have delivered. So as you can see, there's not that many that you can delete. 
So if we clicked on the update template, this is what we would see. So this one has a 1-1-1900 row extended absence request. And so if I were to click on the update, it wouldn't let me do it. It tells me it's a system delivered activity guide template and it cannot be modified or deleted. Okay. And you can, so I added a new um, effective data row here. So that's how you would work with our delivered templates is you add a new effective data row and then you can change it to be what you want, whether you want to delete pages, when you, whether you want to add your own pages, you know, configure it a little bit differently. You can do that, um, but you have to do it with a new effective date. The reason being is if we deliver changes um, at a later date, we'll deliver it to the 1-1-1900 row. And if you've modified that, we would step on your changes. Um, and then you'll notice that even though I added a new row, I cannot delete that 1-1-1900 row. Okay. So here's where the, the functional person would pick it up. And we're using an activity guide to set up an activity guide. I know it seems kind of, uh, dog biting its own tail, but but it works. So here, it's just an introduction through it. Um, and this is, you can pick the activity guide type. So, you know, whether it's a vertical, non-sequential, um, the different types. And then as you pick the type that's available, um, and this is what's available is set up by category, I believe, um, but, as you see it to know if you want to select it, you can click on that and you'll see an example of what it would look like. Okay. Um, and then the next thing is the steps. I mean, obviously you can you put in security if there's additional actions, if you want a sub banner, that's all pretty much self-explanatory. But here's where you select the steps. So this is where you're going shopping. So you say, okay, I want one of these. Uh, how to use the activity guide, I want a company property, um, I want one update to job data, and maybe you want information only, but maybe you want two of these. So you can add two steps, two informational steps, and then later you'll see that you can rearrange them and organize them however you need to use them. Okay. So here is where you would organize the steps. So you can move them up or down um, using the arrows. Uh, you can group the steps. So here you can insert a group. You can configure the attributes so, and dependencies. So things like um, if you have one step that has to follow another step, you can put a dependency. Uh, you can configure a page text. So if it's an informational, uh, you see this informational only one. It, it brings up a rich text editor where you can configure what the text should look like. And then some uh, details. And, and if you need to, you can delete the step from here. Okay. Um, and this is a template assignment. So as I mentioned earlier, you might want to create, say, three separate templates, depending on who is being onboarded. So how do you, does the system tell which template to use? And it's by the template assignment. And of course, you realize that I'm saying this in front of Jeremy and Andrew, who both have like created this. So if I say anything wrong, I'm sure Jeremy will jump in and correct me uh, or heckle me at the very least. Uh, so with the template assignment, there's here we're saying, well, we're going to assign the template based upon the reg region and the company the person is in. So you set that up as the search keys, and then you go to the template assignment, and you here's where you specify, okay, if they're in the reg region USA and their company GBI, then assign them to this template, OBD USA. Um, if they are in the reg region Canada, maybe you only have one company, so you don't have to specify the company. Um, then you give them this um, OBD CAN1 template. 
And for everything else, you just do the standard. Or in, in my example, this could have been an executive, um, for instance. So this is how you can um, assign the templates. And there's also a utility that you can use to test this assignment. So what should you know about Activity Guide Composer, ADC? So every template in Activity Guide Composer is a people tools activity guide, but not every people tools activity guide is an activity guide composer template. So if you're looking at an activity guide and you wanna go and change it and you look at Activity Guide Composer, you may not see it there. So you may have to go to the People Tools Activity Guide to actually change it, depending on where they built it. Um, and realize Activity Guide Composer was built in HCM, and then we moved it to Enterprise Component, which just means that other pillars are able to use the same functionality. Um, it does include a single user template and multi-user templates. So the single user example is onboarding and multi-user example would be say offboarding. It does require people tools release 856 for the single user and 858 for multi-user activity guides. It has a wizard for creating a tile for accessing the activity guide. Um, I can't remember what, but um, what image that went into, but it allows you to create a tile that you can then put onto people's dashboards um, when they need it. And again, it is part of enterprise components now. Um, I think we moved it in 34. I'm not seeing Jeremy Dodd, so I guess it was it, or it wasn't it. But anyway, so it is part of enterprise components. That's only important to know because if you're looking for it, that's where you look under enterprise component. So there's two resources. Uh, the first is the Spotlight series. And this is more a, a more in-depth video of how to use it, how to set it up. Um, it's very good information. And so the link is here. And, and I will be dropping this um, presentation into the chat after um, I'm finished. So tomorrow probably, uh, make sure you come back and look for it if you want a copy of this presentation. Um, and then creating and maintaining activity guide templates and people books. That's actually also a good resource. Okay. Hey, the next framework is going to be, oh, the acknowledgement framework. Let me actually, I see something in chat. Can feature allow configure page text in other steps other than just welcome and summary? Um, I, I think what you're asking is if you can put in um, page text. Oh, in other steps. Realize that the, the steps are built on basically on pages. So you're including a page to include in that step. So you'd have to add the text to that page, say using a drop zone, if it's a fluid page. And then once you add it to that page, then it would appear in the activity guide. So whatever's on that page will appear in the activity guide. Okay. So the acknowledgement framework, it provides you an easy way to um, include a page or sub page for capturing acknowledgements or agreement to terms or saying they're validating the information that has been entered. And this is for self-service components. It includes audit and validation capability and can be easily used as a step in activity guide. And while it has been used um, by time and labor as a sub page, it is not um, widely in, available as a sub page right now. So some examples of where it's been used is in open enrollment, in the fluid timesheet, and in the candidate gateway. So this is an example of it in the timesheet. So this was all configuration 
And what happens is if you turn on the attestation, that's what this is known as. I know a big word. Um, so if you turn on the attestation, then it will automatically pop up this um, sub page and have them click on the agree uh, checkbox. So here is in um, Candidate Gateway, I think this is, or Recruiting. So you see that it's at the bottom. Um, they included a link to Terms and Conditions. So the user could click on this and see the Terms and Conditions, as well as then um, click on the Agree. Um, and here it is used in an activity guide. Um, this is uh, Candidate Gateway as well, I think, um, but this is in their application where it's used in an activity guide. Okay. This is um, a new, well, a relatively new feature, and this is the My Acknowledgements tile. You can get to, well, you get to this from the My Acknowledgements tile. It is an administrator page in which they can, oh, I'm sorry, this is not the administrator, this is self-service. So this is where a person can go in and see all of the acknowledgements that they have done. Um, so in this example, they, they acknowledge their timesheet three times, and so they, they are able to see that. Um, Okay, so configuration. <clears throat> so from a configuration standpoint, you would first set up a acknowledgement category. And why this is important is one, you link security to it. So for, uh, for this example, you can see that you may have a benefits category and you only want really benefits roles to be able to see this or edit it or view the responses. Uh, so, so you you can do your security by the category, um, and we'll also see there's also a way for them to search and filter. So, so category will also become a way to filter out the information. Um, and then here is the acknowledgement. This is so this is the validation and some of the information that's going to be um, available. And this is the configuring the acknowledgement. So here, this is for the candidate registration. You're attaching the category to this, which means that it will inherit the security from the category. Um, and you can have field details. So here you can say that I've, um, you know, I have a text area, and then the, that terms and conditions link is here, and then that I agree checkbox comes next. Okay. So if you click on one of the values, um, well, actually, if you add a new uh, field, the list of possible fields come up. And so this may be, this is kind of the generic. So you can add text box one, text box two. And then from there, you can obviously put in, you know, the name that you want it to be. Um, and the label and the order and things like that. Okay. Um, and then here, if you want to edit the text box, you click on the edit text and it comes up with the rich text editor um, box and you can put in, you know, whatever you like. You actually can, I think, put in a link here. You can put in images here. Um, anything that you can do in rich text, you can put in here. Okay. And then this is the audit trail stamps. So this will tell you, you know, who the user, the user ID, the date, time, and if you want to capture an IP address, you can do that as well. Okay. So this is the administrator part of the review acknowledgement. So we saw the My Acknowledgements, which was the user could 
um, review their acknowledgements. And this is from the administrator standpoint. So here you can filter by category. So again, that's why it's important to set up your categories in a way that makes sense to you so that you know you, your administrators can filter through it as well. Um, they can do it by acknowledgement ID um, or, and that is by, you know, that, that acknowledgement that you set up. So if I have one for timesheet one, maybe for certain timesheets, I have one. For other timesheets, I have another one. I, I would create TS1 and TS2, and you can sort and filter by that, as well as dates. Okay. What should you know about the acknowledgement framework? It does not include digital signature. So if you think that this takes the place of digital signature, it doesn't. Um, and it requires tools release 855. Um, future recruiting candidates will have the ability to view their acknowledgments. Um, actually, that might be, I might have put that in there before we had that my acknowledgments. But it is part of enterprise components again. So if you're looking for it, it's going to be under there. Um, additional resources in the image 33 video highlights, we have a section on the acknowledgement framework enhancements. And then we have a red paper out there on how to implement the acknowledgement framework. Um, the next one is drop zones. So what are drop zones and what do they do? They're pre-delivered, predefined pages, areas on either a classic or a fluid page. They were delivered first as fluid, and then recently we delivered classic them on classic pages. Customers can embed custom content directly on a transaction page through these drop zones. So it doesn't mean that it does away with customizations, but what it does is it captures it in a way so that when you have to upgrade that page, you don't have to reapply the customization. You, it, it brings it along because it says, oh, it's configuration. I know what to do with this. I'm just going to bring it along. Okay. It's delivered at the top and bottom of most fluid pages, but delivered only at the bottom of classic pages. The reason for that is that in classic pages, it doesn't recapture empty space the way fluid pages do. So if we were to put a drop zone at the top of a page and you didn't use it, you would just have a big blank spot at the top of your page and it wouldn't look very nice. So by putting it at or near the bottom of the page, it kind of um, it, it, it kind of makes that a moot point. So the benefits are future updates to the, the updates to that page by PeopleSoft will automatically bring along your customization. And it can be used to add text to a page, add related information, and even add additional data entry fields. Okay. Um, and one thing that we're also going to be looking at is that we've started using drop zone pages. And we'll see how that, where and how that's been used so far. Okay. So drop zones, today most uh, drop zones were added in image 30 uh, to fluid pages. In image 32, my team introduced the concept of drop zone pages, and we'll be looking at that uh, more. And then um, drop zones on classic plus pages were introduced in image 34, and it's on these 10 pages that you see here. Well, I say pages, but they're actually probably components. So within that component, the pages on um, in those components are ones that have the drop zones. Um, oh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so here's some examples of how they could be used. These obviously we haven't delivered. We haven't delivered any um, content in it because these are you are meant to be used by customers to put their own content. 
But here's some examples. So here we've put some text at the top of a page. So maybe you want to add some instructions for the user to be able to see. Um, so you can easily create a sub page, put the text in that sub page, put it in that um, drop zone, and you know, Bob's your Bob's your uncle. So here we have it at the bottom of the page, and we've put a, a link to other um, related information um, in ELM here. And then here we actually have one that's in the middle of a page, kind of. I guess that's the bottom. Um, and it will actually allow data entry. So um, I said that the drop zones were at the top and the bottom of pages. And that's true for the most part. But there are some pages where we may have gotten feedback from folks group or from customers, the ideas page, and we may have put some in the middle of a page because our customers have asked us to do that. Um, so this is an ongoing thing. So if you see a real need to put a drop zone in the middle of a page, please let us know and we will consider it. Okay. Um, so drop zone pages. So drop zone pages are one big giant drop zone. Um, they share a common header with other pages in the component, and it allows you to control the content that displays on the entire page. So where we've seen that um, right now is in my team. So here you see it has the normal my team pages, these first four. And with this configure my team, it also allows you to one, hide or unhide the pages. So this first configurable page, we unhid it <clears throat> and we named it dates and we left it at the bottom. But you could also do things like rearrange the order of the pages in my team. You could rename the, the tab or button. Um, so I think, um, I think I did that on my example. Um, or you can decide to hide it. So maybe you said, well, you know, maybe we don't want to show performance here. So we could hide that page through this. Okay. So this is kind of a, a drop zone page plus configuration. Okay. So here, page order, button label, and hide. So here you see what it would look like at the end. So I changed it from leave balances to accrued leave because my organization calls it accrued leave, not leave balances. So, and I wanted it second. So I, I changed the order and I also added this dates page right here, which is what we're looking at, which has the birthday and the service date of everyone, you know, that I'm the manager for. So this is something that you can create. And as I said, it shares the common header with the other pages in my team, um, but it, it does allow you to put your custom content. Okay. Steps to using a drop zone. Um, you identify and review the drop zones for the component to make sure that <laughs> they're, on, they're there on the page that you want to put it. You have to design and create a sub page. Um, and it gets a little bit technical here. So, um, but basically you review where it, it's going to reside, uh, review the people code on the page, how it's functioning, making sure that it's going to work together. So, and then you configure the drop zone. I'll show you that in the next slide and test and view the page. So configuring the drop zone, it's easy peasy. It's just a matter of finding the component. Here we're looking at the fluid time sheet and dropping that sub page name into the drop zone. That's all it takes. <laughs> so from a functional perspective, it's easy enough. Of course, creating that sub page does require work. <clears throat> so I mean, just to be clear, the drop zone does not make that customization easier. But what it does is it, it makes any upgrades to that page much easier and, and basically hands off 
with any upgrade you do after that. Okay. What should you know about drop zones? Um, first, that it requires release 85706 for fluid pages and 858 for classic plus pages. Okay. Um, so if you're not quite there yet, you probably want to try to get to 858. Um, records and fields on the custom content are part of the component buffer. However, the records and fields will not be accessible by a component interface. Okay. It is part of people tools. Um, so this is a people tools framework. Um, and I did mention that the drop zones on classic plus pages will be at or near the bottom. So there are a few um, resources. So there is a video on um, a video feature overview, otherwise known as a VFO on drop zones on YouTube. And I know that there's an update to this coming out soon. Um, I have reviewed the script for it, so I know that it is coming out soon. There is a, lot, a list of drop zone components and pages in it at HCM, and it's found here. And then in people books about your drop zones, you can be found here at this link. OK, I'm going to kind of I, I see that Jeremy has answered some questions, which is wonderful, which is why I asked him to help me out. Um, but I'm pretty much going to deal with the Q&A at the end just because I have so much to go over that I want to make sure I get through all of the content. Uh, so page and field configurator is the next framework. So um, what does it do? It does a lot. It can change labels on, on page fields. It can mask fields. It can disable and hide fields. Default values make fields required and disable or hide pages. It does a lot, and it's growing every day. It's actually one of my favorite frameworks, just because it's so powerful. So we have delivered it as part of fluid position management. Um, where we actively used it. I mean, PFC has been around longer than that, but in fluid position management, we actually used it to configure the fields that people will see based upon action that they're doing. Uh, we're using in the data privacy, data masking framework, or we're bringing that into it. Um, and why this is important is we did have data masking before, but it was a separate framework. And what that would then mean is that they didn't, it didn't always work well with PFC. But now that they're in the same tool, uh, your data masking and any other um, configuration that you want to do will work together because it's all in the same tool. So we're also going to be including it in the modernization of job data. See, this is the reason why I have to put that safe harbor here, just for that one statement right there. Uh, so it, it will be part of uh, modernization of job data. If you want to know more about that, we have been putting out some blogs. Go check out our application blogs. We've been putting out some information on the modernization of job data, and you can get more information there. Okay. So let's look at some <clears throat> high level, <clears throat> sorry, configuration of um, the data masking piece of this. So here you create a mask and, and you say, okay, for a date field, I want to mask <clears throat> the year with X's. And, and that's what this is telling you. I, I want to retain the separator. So if I have a slash in between, it's still going to be there. <clears throat> um, and then you can define a field group. So what this does is it says for all of these fields that's in this group, I want to treat it the same way. I want to always mask it the same way. So in this case, we might have national ID. Um, for dates, you may have say, OK, all, any, all the dates in my database or all of these dates that we use, I want them all masked the same way. So that way, you don't have to go in and, and mask them individually. It'll know, OK, it's this field. It's part of this field group. Always use this masking. 
Um, and then here, this is the actual page and field configurator. So this is where you can go in and um, determine how you want to mask things. So we do have two configuration types. We have a standard and we have the masking. So here for the masking, um, you could you would pick your field. Um, you can define criteria. So when I say define criteria, you can say things like, well, um, well for masking, it doesn't normally um, apply so much, but for standard. So um, for a standard configuration, you might want to say, well, if the action, I'm going to do it for job. And if the action is, you know, um, um, data change location and the action reason is location, I only want to show certain fields. Kind of like what you did for GSS, for guided self-service, where you only show certain fields depending on the action. Well, now you can do that in uh, page and field configurator, otherwise known as PFC. But for the masking, you probably wouldn't have criteria, <clears throat> but you would say, okay, I've got these fields and this is how I want to mask it. So for say the months and the years of a date of the dates on the personal data component here, I want to do a full mask. I don't want them to see it at all. It, it, it'll all be X's. For the date of birth, maybe I want them to see them so they can send them a birthday present on their birthday, um, but I don't want them to know how old they are, so I want to mask the year. <clears throat> and I'm joking about that birthday present thing. It's probably not very PC. Uh, marital status, same thing. They, they want to do a full mask on that. And here, so that was sequence one. Let's go back up. So that was, oops, sorry, went back up too much. So for sequence one, you want to mask the dates. Um, and this apply additively is very important. What that means is that if you, well, prior to this, prior to having apply additively, and we just had standard configuration, once the system found a criteria that it met, it would apply that and stop. So if you had more than one sequence and it was the conditions were met on the first sequence, it wouldn't go and execute sequence two and three. But now if you select apply additively, it will apply them, um, it will keep going and apply them as it finds it and if it meets the criteria. Okay. Um, so sequence one, we're, we're masking dates um, and marital status. <clears throat> In sequence two, we're masking the national ID number. And then here, if we look at the user list, I'm sorry, this is two and three, but you can see that we can say, how we want to, um, how, who we want to have access to this, or, or, you know, how do we, who do we apply it to? So in this first one, it's for sequence level one, which was the date masking. We only want to include users um, for R. Channing or, or Sean Killigan. We could use different levels. So you can do different levels. Um, you can do it at a role based and say for these roles you want to mask or you can, ex um, um, yeah. So you could do it at a, a role based level, I think. And for, but then for sequence two, for the national ID, I want a different set of users to be able to see it or not see it. Um, and then the, Next step, okay, so then this is what it would look like. I am going to do a short demo of this, hopefully. Um, so this is what it would look like, is date of birth. Remember, we're only masking the, the year. And then for the years and months of their, their age, we're fully masking that. And for the national ID, we only masked, uh, we only unmasked the last four digits and masked everything else. Okay. 
So let's cross our fingers because the last time I did a, a video, once I started it, tech music started playing and I was not able to hear anything and think. So. Okay, so here we are picking personal data as our component. And we have three sequences, as I showed you. So we have sequence one, which does the masking of the year um, here that masks the year. Come on, Lisa, hurry up. Okay. Um, I, I should explain the add, apply additively. So let's go to sequence two, we see national ID. And again, it's, it's based on like country and national ID type. And then sequence three, we're doing a full mask on the middle name. For some reason, they don't want you to see their middle name. So here I could add a fourth one if I wanted to. Say I decided, so I could do page fields or search fields. So we're, we made it able to mask even search fields. So here, say I wanted to hide birth country, state, location, because my organization feels that by someone seeing that and knowing that, that then they could, you know, extrapolate maybe ethnicity and they don't want them to be able to do that. So then we can say we want to include either a role, or we can exclude a role, or we can exclude users. Um, so this is at a sequence level. So this is only for sequence four. And this applies to all with excluded uh, roles and users. Okay, so we're going to let PS, the super duper user, see it, but no, and see Blum, but no one else. Um, and here you're selecting where you want to apply this. So I'm going to go ahead and map it, apply the configuration. It's done, it's mapped, I'm good, I save it. So now if I go in as R Channing, you'll see what our, our channing will see. So let's go to look at the modify a person. And we select it. And let's look at John Patterson. So here, he's just got a whole bunch of X's. So his birthday is is masked. Um, oh, okay, this was before, sorry. This was before I put in the country. We can probably speed this up, but this is um, putting it in. So this is page and field configurator. I think I, I did this out of order. Sorry, guys. And we do kind of have to, we have to do it by video rather than a live demo because um, this Excel events doesn't play well with our VPN. So here, oh, okay. So here we're doing a standard now. Um, so this is the other type of configuration. So this is the standard. So rather than just masking the birth country and state, I want to hide it all together. Um, so the other one, I was masking it. This one, I'm actually going to hide those fields. So as you can see here, I'm just going to select those same fields and hide them. Okay, and here is where, oh, let me go back just a second. So this is where you can um, hide or display, 
or hide dif different pages. So if you said, uh, I don't use anything on the regional page, rather you can do it through security or you can do it here and just hide this, say page number three. Again, we select our users. The only one I'm going to allow to see it is PS. And then I mapped it to the registry. So here I go back in as R. Channing. And what we should see is <clears throat> rather than masking the country, we will hide it all together. So we go back into John Patterson, and as you notice, there is no country information there. So there's no birth country, birth state, none of that. OK. OK, so let's. OK, I just have to rearrange my pages again. OK. OK. So what should you know about page and field configurator? Um, it requires release 85602 for page display and 857.11 for data privacy. Um, it relies on event mapping. So what happens is when you create that page and field configurator um, template or the, the definition, it actually creates an event mapping um, item. It is available to all pillars since we've moved it to enterprise components, and it supports masking of page fields, search records, and prompt lookup fields. You're able to evaluate and mul apply multiple sequences additively. Very, very, very important. It made it much easier to use. And it allowed selection of multiple fields in a single action. So you could go ahead and see all the, the fields on a page and say, I want this, 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 and this. Um, and this is planned for use on job modernization. So we're going to control, or you will give you the ability to control um, what fields people can see as they go through different actions using Page and Field Configurator. So this is a continuing investment. So as you can see from 2018, this is kind of when we first extended it to the fluid components. It was originally for classic components. And then in 2019, we did things like extended it to secondary pages. Um, we can inactivate sequences, um, extended user criteria to include, exclude multiple roles. Um, and able to deliver prepackaged configurations to customers. So this is when we used it for, say, the position management, um, the fluid position management. In 2020, we added data masking um, and applied uh, multiple configurations additively. Okay. So some um, resources. So there's a video feature overview for page and field configurator, um, one for just the data masking, and then um, people books understanding page and field configurator. So there were two other sessions that if you want more information about this, I would definitely recommend you going out and looking at the recordings. One was the David data privacy and managing sensitive information in PeopleSoft and HCM, which was um, presented by Julie Alonzo and Joe Williver. And then the PeopleSoft page and field configurator, recent updates and advanced capabilities presented by Kelly Mills and Joe Williver. Okay, so the next one is HR notifications. Actually, this is one of my favorites. And Nicole made me promise that I was going to present this because it's now one of her favorites as well. So what it does is it provides an easy way to um, 
to send out emails, notifications, or announcements. It provides a log to see failed emails, for instance, and it gives you administrator access to be able to edit and delete communications that may have been sent in error. Um, the benefit of it is it's easy to send communication out to your entire company or a single person. Um, it makes it just as easy to do either one. Um, it's secured as to what and to whom a user can send communications. And we provide app classes for common recipient types. I have to admit that I cheated a little bit here because it's not really um, a configuration framework, but I do think with the recent enhancements that we've made, it really is one of the, the better frameworks that we have out there and more useful. So let's look at it. So today we do use it in ePerformance. We use it in the notify action item button. So you might have seen it in the related actions. We have this notify employee often. And when you click on that, that's actually the HR notifications page coming up. And you can use it in recurring notifications. Yay, Nicole. See, she said HR notifications is the best. So here are some examples, uh, uh, and this is the actual configuration of an HR notification. So to create a notification, you select a delivery method um, here, and it can be a combination of email, notification, or announcement. Then you create, um, you do your notification category. Like you saw in the acknowledgement, Sorry, my, <laughs> my other screen went black for a moment. Um, like you saw in the acknowledgement category, we do link security to that category. So you definitely want to take a look at that. Um, and then you can um, sorry, set priority. So if this is an email that you're sending out, you know how you have your default and then you have your high priority for emails. You can go ahead and set that if you're sending out emails. So if it's really important that you want your people to see, you can set the high priority. And this is like the number one asked for thing in the idea page and which Nicole loves the most, I think. And this is that sender. So now, so previously, when you sent out a notification, it always came from your email address. Well, if you have a shared service center, that might not be appropriate. You may want to send it from that shared service center email address instead. So now if you select other as the sender, you can put what email ID you want to send it from. And you can put in that shared service um, email ID. Um, and then the to and from. So if I were to click on this too, it shows me the recipient types. So these are the app classes that we deliver. I know app classes sounds very technical and it is, but you don't need to know about that because our wonderful developers figured it out already. And what they say is, well, these are common things that people look for. Um, company, department, employee, we even have um, task groups and work groups. So they know what it means if you want to send it to, say, a company or send it to a business unit. So they figured it out. We, you don't have to figure out there. So you just have to say, well, I want everyone in company GBI. And poof, it, it, that's all you have to put in the two. And behind the scenes, the system will figure out what that means, who all is in that group. And if you wanted to be sure, you can look at the view recipient list. You may not want to do it if you're sending it to the entire company, but if you're sending it, say, to a department, <clears throat> or as we'll see in a little bit, you can actually write a query to select the recipients. 
So to make sure that you're getting the right recipients, you can go ahead and view the recipient list and check who you're sending it to. And then lastly, here at the bottom, we have a rich text editor. Um, those of us in development know that we love rich text editors um, because you can't always get them. <laughs> It's not very fluid yet, but if you're on a classic page, you can put a rich text editor and it opens up the possibility for our customers so much. So as, as I mentioned earlier, you can put things like images, you can put in links, you, you can format the text, you can make it dance and sing, you know, pretty much. Okay. And then, oops, I'll go back there. Okay. You can select advanced options, and here is where you would set up things like uh, when you want to post it. So I could create it today, but maybe I don't want to post it until Monday. I can go ahead and, and put in the posting date of Monday, and what happens is that there's a process to post these notifications. And the process should be run, you can run it on a one-time basis, like as you create a notification, you you know, if I'm trying to notify an employee, hey, I need to see something about your timesheet or I need to ask you something about your timesheet, I don't want to wait till that night when it runs and it notifies the employee. I want to send it right now. So you can do that or you can also schedule the process to run on a regular basis. So um, say nightly, you would set it up to run nightly, and anything that it has that has a, a posting date of that day would be run, or or you might run it like just after midnight, so it would post that that everything for that day. Okay. So you have your posting date. Uh, you have an announcement expiry date. So if it's an announcement, you can say, okay, I want it on everybody's. Um, homepage tile from this date to this date. You can say whether you allow the user to delete the announcement. So maybe they say, okay, I read it, done, delete. I don't have to read it again. Whether this is a recurring, so maybe every Friday you have to remind people to turn in their timesheet so, or every two weeks. So you want to put make this recurring where every other week it sends out a reminder for people to turn in their timesheet or or to turn in their expense report, for instance. Um, you can if it's an email, you can enable logging. So it will log all the emails that are sent or if you select here, it only logs the exceptions, so the failed emails. Um, some notification enhancements that went on in image 34. So um, I, I would say if you're going to do HR notifications, take the feature from image 34 or beyond, um, because before that, it made it harder to implement. So if the user enhancement is enter the sender email address, which I've already raved about the priority, uh, preview the recipient list, and a simplified recipient setup, which I'll show you in the configuration. On the administrator side, you can view a summary of the log of the email sent. I showed you how to make sure that the log is captured. I will show you um, what it looks like. And you can view and edit any notification. So you may have a super administrator that can go in godlike and touch in any um, communication. The reason for that is because in case someone sends out a communication error and somehow is no longer there, they're out of COVID, they're out sick, they leave the company, and you've got that wrong communication out there. Maybe it's a recurring announcement. You want to be able to change, you want somebody to be able to either pull it or change it um, or, or, you know, or, or end it at least. So we gave that access. Okay, as far as configuration, we have the installation settings. You have to enable HR notifications up top. Then you put the notification type access, who can access it, who can create, um, which roles can create announcements or notifications. 
And this is that um, super duper user that will be able to edit and, and or delete other people's um, communications. So normally you would have one or two people in the system to do this. You obviously don't want to give it to just anybody. Um, so yeah, that's the installation page. Now setting up the actual, so this is recipient notification. So you can set up different types of uh, recipients. So things like um, pay group, you might want to use a query to determine that. So here we've done, you know, we're going to set up a pay group and we want to use a query, although we do have an app class for it. We want to say which roles can use this. So on any recipient type, you can say, you know, I only want these people to be able to do it. So if I set up, say, a benefits group um, and I only want certain people to be able to send notifications to that benefits group, I can say what role has access to them. Here on the uh, recipient method, we can say how you want. So the, the possible sources include all users, um, application class, query based, role based, or SQL definition. So you can say, you know, where the roles equal this, or you can create a query and and put all your criteria in that query. Now, um, in the case of this uh, pay group recipient that we set query that we set up, it does require someone to select a um, company and pay group. So you create this select prompt record. So it tells it what, what record to prompt again and then what fields it needs to prompt again. So it needs a company, and then it, you can select the pay group. On the confirmation pay, you can again view the recipient list to make sure you selected the right recipient types or recipient um, information. And then go ahead and submit this. And then from there on, it can be used in your notifications. Um, so running this, for instance, uh, when I did the view recipient list, um, it asked me for the company and the pay group, and there's two of them, so or one of them, I can select which one I want, and I can click OK, and th that's basically testing it. And it comes back with the list of people. Okay. Um, Configure email template. I'm not going to over, go over this too much. It's used mostly in, by ePerformance. <clears throat> and this uses variables so that, for instance, they can say, you know, dear percent one. And that will drop in dear Matthew, dear Sally, dear Jeremy. Um, we're, we're cutting off your benefits. Oh, no, no, they would. Oh, no, this is performance. Sorry. OK, um, the notification log summary. So this is the one that administrator can view either all the emails that were sent. So here, when they sent this notification, they say, I want to log everything. So it shows that four were sent and 15 were failed. If you click on view details, it will show you the reason it failed. So there was no primary email address found in the user's profile, for instance. And you can look at the different statuses. What should you know about HR notifications? It does feed into the People Tools notification framework um, so that if you see that, well, now it's a bell up in the top right-hand corner, and you uh, that's the tools notification framework. Uh, so we'll feed into that if we're sending a notification, but they are a separate framework. Um, HR notifications are called from the action menu on fluid pages or directly from the HR notifications page. Um, it does require tools 854 for fluid notifications, and it is considered part of HCM architecture. 
Um, additional resources is we do have a VFO on recent enhancements, and that will go through those um, six enhancements that I told you about. It's pretty self-explanatory, so it, it is a really easy um, framework to use. OK. Um, the questionnaire framework. So it gives you the ability to create a questionnaire for users to fill out. Um, and it, it gives you the ability to define reusable questions and answers. Right now, it's built into the Activity Guide Composer. But we are looking at um, being able to do standalone questionnaires, <clears throat> otherwise known as surveys. But don't tell anybody I told you that word. We're not supposed to use that word. Someone in upper management doesn't like it, but it, it's what it will do. So. Um, so right now, it's used in onboarding and offboarding. You can see it in the Activity Guide there. Um, obviously, in Activity Guide Composer, there's a step that you can add for it, and in Open Enrollment. So here's the Open Enrollment survey. So it's just one step along the way. They say that you know a, a benefit survey. So there's different types of answers you can give. Here, there's a you know you can pick multiple things, and actually it's a ranking. Um, you can do a checkbox, you can do a radio button, um, you can do a basically a, a short description even, and we'll see that. So here we have a short description field, we have a radio button. So it, 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 it's pretty flexible in that you can use it for a lot of different things. So this is the... Um, what it looks like in the activity guide composer. You can see that there's an exit survey here step. Um, and you would configure the the um, the questionnaire and then you would attach it here. Oops. Okay. So here is the questionnaire category. Again, you know us and our categories. <laughs> so whenever you hear categories and frameworks, think security. So again, this will say what roles can do what. And then this is the question pool. So you just add you know, various questions. So if it's in a question pool, you can go ahead and reuse it. So maybe you have the same question that you use on a lot of different um, surveys. And so you want to put it into the pool. And then you can have an answer pool. Um, same thing, if you have answers that you know are commonly used, you can put them into the answer pool. Um, you can also have smart answers. What smart answers are is it's a kind of a sh set up shortcut. So if you have answers that are common or are commonly used, such as days of the week or months in the year. So rather than every time having to add seven days or having to add 12 months, you can say, OK, I want to use this smart answer. And it would automatically add all of the the answers in that pool, so in that short answer, so whether it's days of the week or months. Um, and then here's the questionnaires. So once you create the questionnaires, you can update them, delete them, clone them, preview them. <clears throat> so it's um, it's a way to manage this. This page is how you manage your questionnaires. And this is defining the actual questionnaire. So here you define the, the questionnaire, you know, what is it called? What's the access? Any kind of user instructions you want to include. Um, then you add your questions. Um, you can use existing questions or you can add a new question. So if it's not in the pool, you can add a new one and it will actually ask you if you want to add it to the pool. So if it's something you think, oh, yeah, I might want to use that again, 
you can go ahead and add it to the pool. You can format your answers. Oh, this is adding a new question, sorry. Um, so what days of the week would you like to work? Um, you want it multiple choice, and you want to use the smart answers of the week. That way you don't have to add seven different um, seven different answers. It will already know what those answers are and will add it for you. Um, and so there's um, questionnaire options here. So you can randomize the questions, randomize the answers, have it a, as an anonymous questionnaire. So maybe if you're doing it as part of, say, um, applicant information, you want it anonymous. Okay. So what should you know about the questionnaire fr framework? For the most part, it can be f fully configured by functional resources. So this is one of those good frameworks to give to your functional people. They can go ahead and configure it, and they don't really need um, technical resources to help them. Um, it must be first added to the activity guide composer category. OK, so I lied. They do need a, d a developer or technical resource to add it to the category. And then it can be selected on the template. It does require tools release 855, and it is part of enterprise components now. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a standalone um, a standalone ability will be able to will be coming in the future. Can't tell you when, because uh, according to um, in in Tammy's words, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. OK, so some resources is the video feature overview on the questionnaire framework. And there was a spotlight series on HCM fluid life events. And it does discuss this in there. OK, last framework. And I know it's late. And I thank you for sticking with me. Um, so the file integration framework. <clears throat> this gives you a guided process. Uh, to generate flat files like um, benefit carry interfaces for health insurance coverage, 401k contributions, uh, regulatory reporting for new hires and affirmative action. Um, so it's just, it provides a shorter development cycle. Um, it easily adjusts formats and reruns and retests. It uses queries to define the data that you get for the header, body, the trailer, for instance, or any parts that you need to generate. And you can have security for who can generate the interface. So here's just kind of a pretty picture of the types of interfaces you can create with it. And then here is the file definition. So what you would do is first you say, okay, what kind of type of file is it? What is the output? Is it a fixed link? Um, so you know you have fixed columns. Each you know this column has to be 14. This column has to be 10, for instance. Or is it based upon, you know, is it like a comma delimited file, for instance? And where the destination is, um, and then the security group of users. So this security group is a separate setup. Um, and you say who can access, you know, this file or this or run this file. Um, you define the section. So a common um, definition would be having a header, the detail, and the trailer. And here I mentioned that we use queries to define the data that is captured. So here you have the three different um, three different queries. So maybe the header has to contain the company information as well as the headquarters address. Well, you can use a query to grab that information. And then maybe the, the detail contains, uh, you know, participant information, you know, who, who is participating in a benefit plan. And it has their enrollment information. And then the trailer may have just you know, um, information or counts uh, of what's in the the detail section. <laughs> so you can have three different queries, and 
um, and link them here. Okay. So this is defining a section. So this is for the header. You can say what the order is, <clears throat> the length of it. You can define the format of it. Um, yeah. So it, it could be, you know, fixed width, comma delimited, things like that. Here we have the trailer. Um, and what you can do is you can do something called set value. So if, say, you needed to do a count, you can do a count. Um, <clears throat> and it will, it will calculate that count for you. And then you can do a file preview. Um, I've worked on benefit inter 